Hello everyone. In today's discussion, we are taking a very special topic: career in IFS, that is Indian Foreign Service. Through UPSC, you have number of services. Out of them, top three, which are always the most preferred choices, are IS, IFS, and IPS. When these three letters for each services come, most of you take it in the letters, but it there is a gap. in understanding between the letters and the spirit and especially this relates to ifs indian foreign service because in indian police service and indian administrative service as they most of the time they work inside the country right starting from the block level to the district and also in the state or maybe in the country at the central level so you get a chance to understand more about them interact with them but when it comes to indian foreign service most of the candidates they understand that this service is related only to become an ambassador of india in the country and a candidate has to remain most of the time outside the country but this is not the reality it's a very dynamic career the scope is much wider bigger than that both inside and outside the country to understand what are the different career prospects what are the different positions that indian foreign service officer holds and what are the challenges an officer has to face and how they contribute in a big way to the country while being indian foreign service today we are going to have a discussion with mrs reena pande mrs pande started her career as a lecturer in economics in holy cross college trichy tamil nadu she joined indian foreign service in 1976 batch she has worked in different capacities at headquarters in the ministry of external affairs delhi and served in several missions abroad like brussels manila kathmandu and london she was consul general in istanbul and head of mission of armenia and georgia she was on deputation under three dynamic prime ministers of india mr s d devgoda mr i k gujral and mr atal bihari bajpayee let us welcome mrs reena pande in today's discussion welcome madam to this program on career in indian foreign service thank you as you have very long experience we'll discuss and i'm sure the discussion will benefit a lot to the future aspirants also and also those who have joined to understand more about the service and their scope of work but before we begin can we have a little bit of your background where you were born and brought up and how the whole career began with yes uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity i was born in korg in karnataka Uh, but lived most of my life in Yerkod, which is a beautiful hill station in Salem district, Tamil Nadu. So my education was in the convent in Yerkod, and then for my graduation and post graduation, I came to Madras to uh, Stella Maris College. Uh, I majored in economics, and then I taught economics in a college in Trichy, Holy Cross College. and then came to delhi where i joined the ministry of external affairs and the foreign service so then began a totally what should i say uncharted territory of completely career so before we go into that territory yes. to understand uh, you also had a wonderful career in uh, teaching yes especially teaching economics yes like like that so most of the time students have this question also to why did you change even if you go in the upsc the question comes that comes, you could have yes. enjoyed a very comfortable lucrative career in yes. teaching why did you think of going for indian foreign service well let me say this was more the dream of my mother who was a very intelligent bright uh, lady but who naturally in those uh, years you were not allowed to study too much she wanted to do medicine and be a doctor so she always wanted uh, her children to go out into the world come out of that little hill station little district where we lived and spread your wings so it was she who filled the forms and uh, sent me should i take it like it, it was a dream of her mother but did you also had a similar dream when it was a forced dream on you it wasn't forced uh, well let me say i did not have any particular ambition You're right my mother was my inspiration has been all my life and uh, when i got the opportunity to be in the ministry of external affairs i was very happy 
I mean, I thought, okay, this is another world that opens uh, for this um, girl who has come all the way from the south, never been to the north before. So this was another kind of adventure. So the foreign service for me was a wonderful experience, an experience that I wouldn't want to change and uh, one which I would uh, really love more young Indians to come into. See, that was the time when people knew a little bit about foreign service. Today, people are knowing more about that. And most of the time, the preferred choice is Indian administrative service as compared to Indian foreign service. But at that point of time, and as a female, as a really, yeah, I think it could be a bigger choice. Why didn't you go for Indian administrative service and why thought of Indian foreign service? You're talking of that time, okay? Go back to 1948 and the first woman who entered the foreign service or even came to the in front of the UPSC was from Kurg, Miss C.B. Muttama, who holds a unique place in the Ministry of External Affairs because she defied all norms. Uh, reportedly, she was even discouraged at the interview board by the members to join the foreign service but she said it's her choice and she joined that's a really important information that long back yes somebody could dare of taking it up so nicely today of course a majority of the girls are going for indian foreign service but very few people if i talk in general understand what is indian foreign service there is an opportunity for the students to understand about indian administrative service Indian police service because they come across or they get an opportunity to meet them and understand their activities and works also. But when it comes to foreign service, most of the aspirants for civil services, they are not aware about what exactly is the career there. So in the interest of them, for their better understanding, can you please tell what is a career in Indian foreign service and how they can really contribute to the nation? A career in the foreign service is a wonderful opportunity to broaden one's perspective. Um, and also, in my personal view, I feel that the work you do is so diverse, there is never a dull moment. Because you are out far away from your country and you very often have to uh, think on the spot what action to do. Now, the kind of work you do is also so varied. You may be handling publicity, and promotion of India. You may be handling commercial and economic work, which is totally another field. You may be handling culture, culture and you know, so, social events. You may be handling political uh, kind of uh, work, which is fascinating because you are going to report to your ministry on the political conditions in that country and what India role would be in dealing with that country. And today with the India setting its footprint so much into the world, uh, we have found a voice also in so many fora. We are not just uh, in, uh, we are talking of multilateral fora, we are talking of mini lateralism also where we are in small groups also. India's footprint is now across the world. And I feel that it needs more representation abroad by our people, by our smart young women and uh, men to carry the message of India, which has always followed the principle of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. Sabka Saat, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Vishwas. This is a wonderful kind of message that we give to the world. Uh, and we are not uh, just a democracy. We are also somebody who delivers democracy. So, so it I means that this career is not only for the international relation for political region, but it has a lot of cultural contribution and it has also the economic contribution to give in relation to the country. Before we move forward, I would like to understand the officials, even in Indian police service, or Indian administrative, they also have to work with the politicians. Yes. And you also get an opportunity under Indian Foreign Service to work under politicians. Yes. What is the major difference between the two? Interacting with the politician being in IS and IPS and interacting with the politician in Indian Foreign Service. 
Well, that's a very uh, unique question that I've never been asked before. But um, uh, Mr. Mishra, for me, let me say, one advantage I had, I was a lady. So they were all very kind to me. The families of the uh, Prime Minister, I was able to establish a very good rapport with them, which continued even after I left. So they did not, uh, because I had nothing to do with the local politics in uh, Indian Foreign Service, there is minimal political interaction. We hardly ever, because we don't, while we are posted in Delhi also, we have nothing to do with even the politics of the Delhi government or the politics of any state. We only deal with them if they are going on a visit abroad, a delegation. Even then, we do not come into direct contact with them while at headquarters. Their office or the concerned ministry gets in touch with us to work out the program in coordination with our embassy abroad. It's when they come actually to that country and you are posted in that mission, you have direct contact with them. But that is also so minimal. It could be for one day. It could be for two days, max three days. That's all they are there for. And their program is already fixed. So you just, you know, facilitate their interaction with the local political leaders or for whatever purpose they came. If they came for a conference, you make sure they are comfortable and they go back. So it's not, and they also know that we have nothing to do with politics in India. So I think for that fact alone, there is less possibility of any kind of uh, interference friction also. or uh, inter nothing, absolutely. So should we take like this that uh, in Indian Foreign Service, you have connection mostly with external affairs ministry. So naturally the minister and the politician in that ministry will be important for you yes. and also the PMO. Is yes. it like this? PMO also, but again, they would deal with your uh, foreign secretary, foreign minister, even there. It is not a direct kind of uh, dealing with the PMO. It would be only joint secretary and above. For the rest, like as a director, as a deputy secretary, as an, you don't have that kind of direct dealing with the PMO. Okay, when you come at the joint secretary level? level yes, because you will go there for meetings, coordination meetings, or, or the visit of the prime minister to a country, which is one of the most important kind of functions. Coming back a little to the early phase of the career, when the training begins, they, of course, in the initial training is together in Missouri with IS and IPS also. But then there is a separate institution for that in close to JNU Indian Foreign Service Training Center that is in Delhi. So what is the difference in this training and what happens all and how long is the training period? See, when the IFS probationer is selected I mean, into the IFS. The training program lasts for two years, two odd years. The first four or three months is in uh, LBSNA in Masuri, where that training is for all, for all the services. They are trained on um, national policy, on everything connected with the nation, with development, with poverty, with anything to do with administration in the country. They are also given uh, the essence of India's foreign policy. In the sense, it's not lessons, of course, but people come to lecture them on uh, foreign policy issues so that they understand it. It's only after the four months of uh, foundational course that uh, those who are not IAS go to their respective training where they get that specific training for their service. Related to the service. So the foreign service uh, probationers come to the Sushma Swaraj Foreign Service Institute in uh, Delhi and they are there for about uh, four to six months where they are given in-depth training on uh, foreign policy, on diplomacy, on all the issues that uh, concern the world in right. which India yeah. has a role. A disarmament, uh, you know, you name it, climate change, food security, energy security, how India would deal with this. So, and they get uh, people visiting uh, kind of uh, 
experts to give them lectures. There is also the military attachment. There is the Bharat Darshan. There is the district training where they are attached to a district and study how a district is managed by so a there DC. Is interesting information for yes. the aspirants. That yes. District attachment is also yes. Very so it's very comprehensive. Because when you represent India abroad, you have to be familiar with what is happening in the domestic scene also. Foreign policy is such a domestic policy is a component also of foreign policy. To know about your country in yes. detail from the grassroots level. Yes, and even they do what is called uh, hospitality training. You know, where you're taught all the table manners, the, the what kind of, uh, you know, how you should entertain, how do you represent India even in that aspect, the food and, you know, how do you set a table, how do you put all those, uh, you know, cutlery and crockery which it's is a, used for it's what? It's an elite class of yes, services that you but it is required because yes, in this to... it is uniform across the world that every country's diplomat puts his best foot forward. This is very interesting information that mostly his parents might be thinking that the training happens only abroad or maybe in the external affairs ministry. After the foreign service, they come back to the ministry You're right. for about three, four months where they are attached to desks. After the training is completed in the foreign institute, there is concept of posting where they will go, how that is decided and what role the foreign languages play in this one? The first posting is always uh, in the direction of the language that you've been allotted. So once, uh, during your training period, you get a language allotment. This is allotment or there is any choice these candidates can make? You can give choice, but the ministry has the discretion to decide. If everyone asks for French, what do you do? Or everybody asks for Arabic, you know, something like that. So they also have a kind of uh, plan, like how many they need in the various languages. So you are allotted Turkish language, you know, you have every kind of language. And then you are sent to that country. If you have taken French, it no, doesn't just, mean... Just to interfere. Yes. It means that their candidates may have the choices of the language. But ultimate allocation will come from the from ministry. The, they, they will try to accommodate you, but they also have a vision of what languages they need to, you know, further strengthen the efficacy or the efficiency of the foreign service. So, if you've got French, you have a cho uh, the ministry can decide to post you either to Paris or to Brussels. So. Then if you get Mandarin, you go to Beijing. You get Russian, you go to Moscow, like that. So Arabic, all the languages, most of them. Now I don't know if they've added any more languages. Now, when it comes possible. to languages and choices there, is it that somebody who has been allocated a particular language, so his posting or her posting will remit to that area or it can be changed later on also? I know this is something... Uh, which would mean specialization, yes. right? Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't happen like that uh, in the majority of the cases. After you've gone to France, you may be posted uh, the next posting to Malaysia. And then you have to learn fresh the new language. No, there it's optional. For in your interest, you learn the language. The government, of course, pays for the tuition. Like you hire a teacher and the teacher is not only for you. It is for many in the embassy who don't know the language and wish to learn just, a, you know, a working knowledge like, then of course it is uh, paid for. Is it like this that in initial period of the career, when the training is over and the initial postings are coming, yeah. candidates will be posted according to their language choice. But later on, this is not a barrier. No. When you grow with your seniority, you can you be posted can be anywhere. anywhere in the world. But some, if they have excelled in their language, like, Languages which are considered uh, difficult, like Mandarin. If you have excelled in that, you could go for a second time posting. Right. Or you could go back as head of mission one day to that country. That happens. A lot of Russian speaking and Chinese speaking have gone back to those countries on a second posting. Or Japanese. See, these are 
the languages, no, which are, but French, many know French. And there are many countries where you can use French. Many of the candidates who join, they yes. have preferred choice. They should go to developed countries, to Europe, to America. So is there any choice anywhere or no. they, this is just a random system no. on that? What the ministry does is every time they issue the notice for the board where the foreign service postings are decided, they look at your background, like where did you come from? In your last posting, if you came back from uh, Washington or Geneva or London, it is um, more likely that you will now get a not a developed country posting. Okay. If you are in the foreign service, you must experience every kind of posting, A, B, C. And there are the hard stations, postings to Afghanistan. And many countries. Okay, so there is a balancing. Yeah, maybe there is a balance that they try to <laughs> keep. That you will do a very good station, then you'll do a middling station, then you must do a very very developing country. You know, which is uh, where the facilities are less. When it comes to hierarchy of posting, where from, and what is the term used for the first initial uh, ranks there, and what is the hierarchy that goes to the top level? See, in the ministry, it is just like in uh, other ministries of the other services. You will be an undersecretary, then you are a deputy secretary, okay. then you are a director, then you are a joint secretary, additional secretary, secretary. And of course, foreign secretary is above all, okay, that one post. When you are abroad, it's different. The junior most uh, position can be like language attache, then you come as uh, third secretary, second secretary, first secretary, counselor when you are director, minister when you are joint secretary, and then of course, head of mission. This can be ambassador or high commissioner. Okay, depending on the country yes. in which you Then there are consulates, that is, in many countries, India does not have a mission only in the capital. They have what is called consulates in other important cities in that country. For example, like you have in America, you have Washington. But then you have a consulate in New York. You have a consulate in Houston. Because, you know, the importance of those towns, either for economic reasons or large uh, Indian origin community, or many such factors. So you open missions there. Now they are also the head of post. Now when it comes to the perks especially, what is the difference in the salary if they stay in India or they go outside India? When you are in India, your sal salary is according to the grade fixed for anybody in the government of India, in IAS, IPS and all, it's the same. Right. When you go abroad, you are definitely given what is called foreign allowance in addition to your pay. That is additional. Additional because life abroad is different. You have to spend more. That come in the currency of that country or it comes in, in the, the dollars? In the currency hmm? of that country or uh, very often you are paid in dollars. But that is decided according to the cost in the country? Yes. The living costs are worked out very, very carefully by the team in, in the ministry that goes out periodically to countries and uh, studies it very, very deeply. They go to supermarkets, they will look at all the prices of essential day-to-day -day commodities, use uh, local transport, you know, everything. They will go and eat in a restaurant to see how it is. All the factors are taken, medical, cost of medicines, all that makes your life well, comfortable. Well researched and surveyed. Yeah, well researched. Things. They come back and then they decide what is the foreign allowance that should be given to you. Apart from the foreign allowance, you are given an entertainment allowance, which is naturally fixed according for the third secretary, it's one, second secretary, a little more. Okay, so there is entertainment allowance also. Yes. There. Every month, you are expected to spend this money, not on yourself or entertaining your family or friends. You will entertain the people that you are in touch with in the local, among the local people, local government, the media, 
cultural organizations, think tanks, people who are of use to you in the discharge of your duties and in the interests of India. Do you have to submit report for that? Yes, with whom every you month you submit to your ambassador. There is a register where you say this month I gave a lunch. Who are the guests? You will write out the guests. And where? Did you do it at home? Or did you do it in a restaurant? If you do it in a restaurant, you have to produce the voucher. And the residence benefit, do you get there? Yes, we get fully furnished flats anywhere. So one of the greatest uh, advantages is when you're on transfer, when you're moving, you don't have to carry furniture. What about the conveyance? Conveyance over there, it's only, there'll be always a staff car, what is, apart from the ambassador's car, which is called the flag car, that is the only car that will bear the flag. There will always be, depending on the size of a mission, an additional vehicle, which is called a staff car, which you use for your official purposes. Otherwise, you buy your own car. Right. Or you use public transport. You get allowances for that also, vehicle allowances? Not vehicle allowance, no. It is general allowance. General, you have to manage it. your foreign allowance. Covers all that. Now, uh, especially diplomatic passport yes. of the country. What is that and what is special about that? Well, special is the red passport is um, across the world respected. That is, it, that is available only to Indian Foreign Service officers or it can be for also no, the... No, it is given also to other officers from other services if they are going abroad You're right. For on a posting or some special assignment. It could be for one month, two months or so, but officially. Or they are going part of a delegation from their respective ministries. Then the same formula, but in our service, everybody from... Once he joins the IFS, gets the red passport. In for the other services, it is up to director level, white passport or the official. Okay. Joint secretary and above the red passport. So what is special about red passport? Please explain a bit more of that. Well, as I said, it's respected all over the world and given the courtesies that uh, under the Vienna Convention is written for the red passport. Uh, when you land at the airport, you don't go through the normal immigration channel. There is a separate channel where it's always written for diplomats. So it's a fast track. You go through that where they don't need to ask you, show your baggage. They should not. I mean, they don't. So it's, you just come out. These are special privileges. Yes, that and you... with the diplomatic passport, you get access to, say, the lounges in the airports all these privileges. There are a lot of these perks that you become You become VVIP, yes. especially in that. You right? travel always mm -hmm. in uh, good airlines and once you reach a certain level, only in business class in all these airlines, you are, uh, I mean, uh, given all the respect across the border. Stay in and all also the world. <laughs> in your service abroad, you always stay in the best of places. Wherever you go, you go on local tours, anywhere. One major concern is about the spouse benefit and also the family. So what benefit and the, the uh, facilities are given to them? and children. the children, hmm. the Ministry of External Affairs pays in full the education charges for two children, maximum of two. If you have more than that, then it's your responsibility to pay for that child. Travel is free. The same like the officer and uh, you get uh, home leave once in your posting back to wherever you are in India and for 40 days, the usual uh, leave uh, period where the whole family can travel. And then if you are single and go as a head of mission, you are allowed to designate somebody as your hostess for which the government will pay. You take the person with you. It could be a sister, an aunt, or somebody from your family, you know. They are only the family members, or it could be friends no, also? No, no. Only, only the family. family. Yes, yes. Maybe because of safety, security? Many reasons, yes. So they, they are allowed to? They are allowed. So what about the schooling and education of the children? That's why two children are free. The government picks up the 
uh, fees, you always have a panel of schools. Now, that's another interesting aspect of the service abroad, when you go abroad. There's always uh, panels, you know, which the government say, these are the schools, these are the hospitals, you know, like these are the packers and movers, which you can, because it's all been earlier access, which is good, which is uh, within our India's economic uh, strength. How much time one stays outside India and how much inside India? The normal pattern is two years at headquarters, three years abroad. There are some stations which uh, are only two years because of security reasons in that country or unsafe conditions, two years only. The very few countries like that where you are posted only for two years because they're considered hard stations. Uh, the normal posting is for three years. Three then. years and then, and you, then back you come to back mm -hmm. for two years again. There are occasions when from one posting you are sent directly to another. This is also because of vacancies, no? maybe at headquarters, at your level, there is not that vacancy. So they can send you six years as maximum, but then you have to come back. You mean to say in continuity, one can continuity? stay for six years? Yes, in another station. from Then station you stay back a, for two years in the country. Then you stay back in the headquarters, two years. Headquarters is two years. Okay, then again you can be back. Get back. Was it your mother's dream or also a kind of compulsion on you that you have to do it only or you had your own choice? Uh, there was no compulsion. Let me say that my mother's dream, I always, uh, I mean, I adored her. So whatever she said, I felt was in my best interest. So I kind of just went in the flow of her dream without feeling compelled. That's the best part of it, right? And you enjoyed your career all through? Very much, all through. There may be like uh, when I was going on my first posting to Brussels and uh, when I boarded the Air India craft and I was sitting, suddenly it struck me that I'm going alone into the unknown. Never been abroad. Now I'm going into a mission as an officer to work. I don't know anybody there from before. So suddenly in the plane, I realized, my God, what am I going into? And tears rolled down my eyes silently in the side, you know. And then the stewardess saw it and asked me if I was, you know, why I was, was crying. <laughs> I told her like this, I'm going alone. And, it's, and they were so sweet, you know, they kind of pampered me after that, saying, no, no, you're going to represent India. You should be, you know, happy. That was the only time that I felt suddenly, what am I getting into? But once you reached there, so what was all the mindset? It was so wonderful because everybody in the mission from top to bottom or let's say bottom to top kept a very uh, loving eye on me, maybe because I was single and, you know, come out. Everybody was so kind that I never again looked back on that aspect. With your vast experience of the service, can you please tell us about the roles and responsibilities that Indian Foreign Service officers play? Uh, the roles and responsibilities are so wide-ranging and uh, very, very varied, I must say, because uh, when you are at headquarters, it is different. You are given a desk and you deal just with that. Say you are dealing with the disarmament, so you deal with all the issues relating to disarmament. You are in the UN desk, you are dealing with issues related to what is happening in the UN, both in Geneva and all the UN related offices in New York, etc. Or you are in a territorial desk, what we call territorial desk in the ministry, where you may be dealing with the Gulf division. You are dealing with all matters related to countries in the Gulf, you know, framing the policy, assisting in framing the policy how we deal with the Gulf as a whole and with individual countries. So when we are talking of headquarters, you are dealing with the, the policies of the government of India relating to all foreign policy matters. You are coordinating with other ministries like the economic ministries, with the ministries dealing with climate change, with the ministries dealing with energy, food, because these are important matters, food security, energy security, you, you talk about all this. 
or uh, our uh, requirements of energy. You are also dealing with disarmament. You are dealing with people of Indian origin abroad. So how your policies should be framed to give them the, you know, help. You are dealing with passports and visas and uh, consular matters, anything related to Indians living abroad, any problems they have, death, birth, marriage, all kinds of issues. So it's a very vast encompassing role from the headquarters, which all the officers uh, play a part, a major part. And uh, dealing with the delegations, visits of VIPs, uh, inward and outward going delegations, which takes up a lot of time and attention and detailing. And then you deal with all multilateral issues, all our relations with any multilateral organization. Then with all the like Quad, BRICS, uh, SCO, G20, all these uh, organizations you are going to deal with. When you are posted abroad, you will be dealing, say, with a part of the whole. Like, supposing you will be dealing with culture, you will be dealing with uh, commerce and economics, with uh, political matters, defense, security. Multiple consular. issues. Yes, multi consular is a major part. You are dealing with issuing of passports, visas to the people there. You are dealing with all kinds of consular matters, which is very wide. You have to project India. And India's role, not just in the region, but on the international scenario. You have to take care of India's interests also. And uh, we give aid also. I mean, not many are uh, still knowing that India gives a lot of aid. Right. India gives aid to countries that are developing. This is part of the South-South cooperation. India is now going in deeper into various regions of the world, not just neighborhood first, but the region beyond. We are going south, Sagar project. We are going far east. We are going across Africa, America. We are engaging with the major powers of the world, like America, Japan, Russia, China. All this comes into the uh, play. So when you are abroad, you have so many things to look at. Even if you are posted in a country that is, uh, say, in Africa, even there you have to watch what is uh, that country doing with relation to China, what is China's role in Africa, uh, what about our trade prospects. You know, India is so much, today the world is looking for rare earths, rare minerals, uh, for the semiconductor issue. As you know, it is one of the biggest issues. This is uh, strategic economics, right. where you want lithium and you want, uh, you know, uranium, you want cobalt, all these, which India doesn't have. So, so there, there is commercial a, exchange. Yes, there, there is trade. a competition in the world for these, particularly after the COVID, when it was realized that supply chains play a major role. So we have to diversify your supply chains. You cannot rely on just one country or one geographical region for your supply chain. And this is something the whole world woke up to during the COVID period and are trying to, you know, get their resources so they become self-reliant in certain extremely necessary uh, inputs for their, you know, industry. So, you know, that it is so wide. You are also in defense. Uh, we are now uh, manufacturing weapons, small weapons. You find markets for them. You also look what would be the best that can augment India's defense. So, you know, and then you do civil aviation. So, it is not limited to one or the other thing, but everything which yes. can benefit. Connectivity is a major issue for us. What are the challenges, especially when you are, for service, like we see the crisis related to Ukraine-Russia war. And in this situation, if you are posted there, so what challenges kind of challenges are when you are posted in countries 
where it is not exactly, um, what shall I say, a comfortable situation. These are challenges. You are posted in China. Uh, you are posted in Ukraine. You are posted in Russia. How do you handle this? How do you get the best uh, kind of uh, inputs into the policy of your country in dealing with these issues? Your contribution from abroad is a major contribution. What do you advise to the ministry as to how this problem should be dealt with? We had so many issues uh, like challenges are natural disasters. Yes, and the pandemic was a disaster. Especially when it comes to evacuation. Yes. India played a major role in evacuation from Ukraine. Earlier from uh, even in the pandemic, pandemic COVID-19, yeah. the role that India played, in which it helped other countries also. This is where the foreign service officers play very important role. Very big role, which is unknown. Like they are not, they are nameless. They are just uh, people. But you know that it is because of their efforts we managed to get all the Indians back. You mean to say that there is not much of publicity like in IS and IPS? But the people play very silent role they in play Indian a foreign role in the service and, of the country. Uh, a very effective role, and I think that's the way it should be. This is the best way. We also, you know, supplied uh, vaccines to more than hundred countries. Now this is all part of diplomatic. This was a serious yes. political discussion also in also, the country that yes. you are sending to other countries when you are having scarcity. But we believe in, uh, you know, this. Uh, that it's not only our development that we should look at, we should also look at the development of all countries because only then there will be peace, a lasting peace. Yes, <laughs> and I think that's a brilliant uh, philosophy which has remained unchanged. You know, they often ask you what are the changes in India's foreign policy. There have been changes, yes, but you have to change as you go along, but the basic tenets of uh, India's foreign policy has not changed. It's continuing. Panchil was uh, laid down by the founding fathers of our uh, country when we gained independence. That continues. I mean, uh, peaceful coexistence and uh, help to all countries with no non uh, i mean with the no expectation of reciprocity you know that is our spirit that you give when somebody else needs your help so that principle continues to be effective and efficient in the indian foreign service what kind of aptitude attitude and the temperament should be there with officers you must have the aptitude to meet people, right. engage in so much of uh, social activity, which you would normally not do when you are back home, even in headquarters. Uh, because when you are out, there is a responsibility on you that you are representing your country. You are not you. Right. You are subsumed under that. You are representing India. So, on a particular day, like if you have the national day celebration of a country, and on that day, coincidentally, there are three countries having their national days, you cannot say, I will not, I'll go only for one, I will not. No, that choice is not yours. Yours is that I will go to all three and... You mean to say in the country where you are posted? Yes. If there are national days... And, and and there will be multiple countries yes. program coming On one the after same. the other. Yes. So you have to be present Please. everywhere. Yes. Right? Mm. Because you are the face of India. That is what I want to give the message, you know, that when you are abroad, you are the face of India. So you should be a face that inspires people, instills confidence in them also that when you speak, you are not doing double speak. Right. Even if you have to say no, in diplomacy, there is a way to say no that that person understands why you are saying no. I think this is very important and... Uh, you Social and communication yes, skills. Yes, right. and you must not have that, even a tinge of arrogance, you know. Because every country has its plus points. 
you cannot go out there thinking i come from a civilization that is like that and you know ancient and this no what are you today you see that is your strength inner strength but you have to portray that today you are a country that is ready to mingle with the whole world ready to help everybody and who wants development for all and you must respect that country's culture its traditions its food even if you are not comfortable with it that is a very important point i'm not saying that you must eat the food they eat which you may not subscribe to that is not but you know sometimes you have a tendency to say in a very uh, kind of maybe rude way oh i am i don't eat this or i i'm trying to tell you there should be a finesse in when, everything that you even do. if it's when you are interacting with the yes. people of the enemy countries yes. you still have to be still have good to be in polite behavior mm. and courteous mm. and always remember that that's what they think indians are, should be polite courteous you know respectful without in any way being a doormat that confidence you should have i would like to know especially the regions why these parents should prefer to go for indian foreign service in terms of their career and service to the nation well because i think that uh, uh, with the kind of social media we have nowadays so many uh, things keep circulating which are not true which are uh, provocative which are incendiary so i feel that you must go and represent your country abroad and get the best of those countries for our country and give your best to that country india needs it today india needs not just very good efficient and dedicated people inside india but it needs outside also that will i'm sure in the long uh, term impact on india's image image can be damaged so easily again because of the effect of social media we are seeing that uh, so many anti national activities also take place even today there uh, a consulate in america of ours has been attacked so you know i have a feeling that the more you join the service and dedicate yourself that i will represent my country to the best of my ability and always get for india the best from every country that itself is a great uh, that development is, that is a great reason to yes. join for service of the nation but as a reward return from that career because everybody has some self interest also in yes. terms of career your reward life. is this opening up your mind to the whole world the perspective your whole perspective changes your children you can get them maybe india is not lacking in good education but you know how we all want something uh, from abroad he it is open to him and uh, to his education. children best of education best of job opportunities not just in india in india also he'll get even better job but abroad the whole world is uh, yours to choose from Uh, secondly you uh, acquire some creature comforts which when you come back to india help you in your retired life to live comfortably uh, you make a whole lot of friends across the world which helps even when you are retired to talk to them about india if they have any misgivings or oh, you know what's happening you talk to them and i'm telling you it has an impact so these are the many uh, issues you know wonderful exposure of the world world and relationships and uh, <laughs> that way i feel uh, you become more tolerant mm-hmm. of other people's uh, way of life thank you very much madam for sparing your valuable time i am sure by watching you and listening to your experiences many will decide to go for indian foreign service in the coming episodes we'll be having discussion on geopolitics and many issues of india's foreign relations thank you don't forget to like share and subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update